Ne? Thank you. That's nice. Can you hear me in the back? Silly question, because if you can't hear me, then you won't know that I asked whether you could hear me. Today is a serious topic. 101 years ago, almost exactly to this day, Central Florida was the home to a town called Rosewood. Then, very suddenly, it wasn't. Let me give you an introduction first. Juneteenth celebrates the day when the enslaved people of Galveston, Texas, learned that they had been freed. They were the last group to become aware of this freedom, and each year, black communities around the country commemorate the day. This past year, the University Club of Winter Park sponsored a, a reading at the ceremony by the Poet Laureate of the City of Orlando. So along with a number of our club's leaders, I attended the event. And I found myself seated in the front row next to a charming lady named Lizzie Robinson Jenkins. Never fails. <laughs> ah. Got it. Other than by our exchange of names and uh, some polite conversation before the ceremony began, I had absolutely no idea who this woman was or what her role in the proceedings was going to be. Miss Lizzie, as she was called with great respect, was called to the podium and spoke at length about Rosewood, a subject about which I knew virtually nothing. The room was completely silent as Miss Lizzie told us that in January 1923, her aunt was gang raped by a mob of white men before they in turn destroyed the town of Rosewood. Why had I never heard of this before? I thought rosewood was a kind of wood that went into nice furniture. But before we can talk about the history of rosewood, or why history has forgotten about rosewood, you first need to understand what it was that happened there 101 years ago. The tiny town of Rosewood is located about 50 miles southwest of Gainesville, very close to Cedar Key. I can't see if I'm pointing at the right direction. Right in there. It's obviously, it's no longer on the map. The area was mostly swampland and cypress. And by 1923, Jim Crow laws were very well established, and the town was almost exclusively black. Very little has been written about Rosewood, and very few documents describing the town have survived. However, one commentator called the town a well-established middle-class community. But to me, that description sort of stretches the definition of what constitutes middle class. The town consisted of about 60 houses, three churches, a one-room schoolhouse, a Masonic temple, a general store owned and run by a white man, and one juke joint, which was well known for gambling, drinking, and occasional fighting. Rosewood was a company town, and it was run at the mercy of the Cummer Lumber Company. The company was headquartered in the town of Sumner, which is about three miles from Rosewood. The company's white employees lived in Sumner, where the sawmill was located. The black employees who lived in Rosewood walked to and from Sumner every day. The men and boys of Rosewood cut trees and transported them through the swamp 
to the sawmill where other Rosewood men operated the sawmill. All of the foremen were white, as were all of the management employees. The work was grueling and it was dangerous. Most of the women and girls of Rosewood made ends meet by doing the laundry of a few white families. Life was hard. Automobiles were a rarity, and it was mules and oxen that were used to haul wood from the swamp to the sawmill. There was only spotty electricity in Rosewood, and the only telephone was in the general store. Most of the men hunted to put meat on their tables. But despite these hardships, there were a number of multi-generational families in the town. I suspect that it was because of the common adversities that they faced that the residents of Rosewood cared for and about each other. The problem started on Monday, January 1st, 1923. There are no contemporaneous documents explaining what happened. This description is based on statements given by survivors many years after the events. And complicating our understanding is the fact that some of the statements are contradictory. Nevertheless, the essential facts are clear. Unfortunately, it's a familiar story. Fanny Taylor, a married white woman living in Sumner, claimed that she was assaulted by a black man who then fled into the swamps toward Rosewood. There was evidence of recent sexual activity and slight bruising to her face, but no witnesses saw or heard the black assailant. Now, while recent commentators have suggested that Mrs. Taylor was involved with a white lover who may have hit her during an argument and that she, was, she then invented this black assailant so that she could uh, explain to her husband the existence of her bruises, that thought never occurred to the white community at the time. Instead, a call went out for the black assailant. The sheriff sent bloodhounds to the Taylor home and the dogs followed a scent from the home in Sumner to a home in Rosewood three miles away that was owned by a black World War I veteran who was not home at the time. But from there, the scent was gone, totally vanished. For some reason which is now unknown, the white men did not suspect the owner of the home, but instead they simply assumed that he had helped the rapist escape on a wagon. Later that day, the mob came upon a wagon owned by Sam Carter, a black resident of Rosewood. I'm sorry to have to say this. The mob knotted a rope around Sam Carter's neck, threw the rope over a large tree branch and began to lynch him. They did not intend to kill him at that time, but instead their intent was to torture him into telling the whereabouts of the fugitive. Young Carter would have said anything to avoid being lynched. And frightened for his life, the young man promised the mob that he would tell them what they wanted to hear where the fugitive left his wagon. So the mob and the bloodhounds went to that spot and they could find no scent. So the mob struck, uh, strung up young Carter again, but not wanting to wait for this version of justice, a member of the mob killed Carter with a blast of his shotgun. This was the first fatality. After several days of relative peace, the mob renewed its search for the attacker on Thursday, January the 4th, 1923. 
The mob was now apparently led by two men. D.P. Wilkerson was a constable for the justice of the peace as well as a deputy sheriff. In those roles, he had the ability to arrest and convict Rosewood's men of minor offenses and then lease these prisoners to private companies who treated them like slaves. I'm not making this up. Although this was a common practice in Jim Crow, there are books that confirm this. I recommend one to anybody who's interested, a book that won the 2008 Pulitzer Prize entitled Slavery by Another Name, authored by a man named Douglas Blackman. So that was the first leader of the mob. The second leader of the mob was Henry Andrews, who was a foreman at the sawmill. His nickname was Boots. And they called him Boots, in their words, because he was so mean he even kicked white people. For no reason that we can establish by, by any sort of reliable source. The mob went to the home of Sarah Carrier. Her home was used as a place of refuge by many of her neighbors for reasons that are unclear to us at this day. But Sarah's niece, many, many years later, recalled telling her friends, and this is a quote, these crackers look like they're gonna raise up sand tonight. They're gonna come back here tonight and try to kill us. End of the quote. Sarah's adult son, Sylvester, came to Sarah's house to help protect the people that were there. The people in the house, Sarah Carrier's house, heard the mob approaching. Sylvester pushed one of the girls into a closet, and he came in behind her to act as a human shield. The two mob leaders jumped onto the porch and were confronted by the Carrier's dog. Wilkerson shot the dog and fired into the house, hitting Sarah Carrier. Another bullet took out the eye of a young man. Upon hearing this shooting, the others in the white mob began firing their guns. Most of Rosewood's residents who were not in the Carrier house heard the shots and began to run. Some ran to the general store where the white owner sheltered them. Others ran to the sawmill where a white supervisor hid them among the stacks of wood. Some hid at the juke. Still others sought safety in the swamp. But many of these people who ran ultimately left the state of Florida never ever to return. After firing into the house, Wilkerson broke down the door and rushed inside. Seeing this from the closet where he was protecting a young girl, Sylvester fired his shotgun. When the shooting was over, Wilkerson, Andrews, Sylvester, and Sarah Courier were all dead. The confirmed count now stood at five. The white citizens in the area flooded the town, ready for blood. They killed every black person in sight, most of whom were too old or too sick to run. There is no verifiable number of the victims. Estimates run as high as 150 people. When all of the residents of Rosewood were either dead or gone, every single structure in the town was burned to the ground except for one, the home of the white owner of the general store. Sorry, I'm having a little difficulty here. All right. A grand jury was convened. 
about one month thereafter. It was disbanded after one day, saying that it could not find any witnesses who were willing to testify. Now you need to fast forward 59 years to 1982. A white St. Petersburg journalist named Gary Moore, no relation to the television personality. Moore visited Cedar Key to get background information for a story that he was working on about the hunting of alligators. He was talking to a local woman when she stated that Cedar Key was an all-white community. Moore thought this was strange and asked why this was the case. And the woman said nothing at all, but directed him to a local historian. And the historian said, again, a quote, I know what you are digging for. You want me to talk about that massacre, close quote. Moore was given an abbreviated story, and he went to the place that had been identified as the spot uh, where the town of Rosewood had existed. He found some pieces of broken pottery, but there was nothing else of interest to the site. It was barren land, except for some mobile homes that some white people resided in, the homes having only been race recently put into place. But Moore's interest was piqued. Feeling that he had come on a real story here, he went to the University of Florida, which was only 50 miles away, and he wanted to review its historical records. Librarians at the university told Moore that there had been no massacre or they would have been aware of it. <laughs> Moore didn't take that for an answer. He did further research and he found a reference to Rosewood in the Florida Historical Quarterly. And this led him to research some newspapers from 1923. Never fails. Huh. There we go. He found, looking at the newspapers, information from multiple newspapers around the country. The St. Augustine Evening Record reported 25 or more heavily armed Negroes are making a stand in a small hut. Almost identical stories appeared in the Ocala Evening Star, the Jacksonville Journal, the Florida Times Union, the New York World, and the New York Age. And the Washington Post reported, quote, the Negro and a number of his friends had barricaded themselves in a shanty on the outskirts of the town and defied any white man to come near them." Close quote. All of these articles were dated January 5, 1923. And these stories lead to a question. The answer to this question may lead to the answer of our earlier question. Why is it that none of us have ever heard about Rosewood? How is it that these newspapers got the facts wrong? Even a hundred years ago, newspapers had access to the newswire. But perhaps naively, we would expect reliable papers to verify alleged facts before publication. These questions were put to, to, to Moore. Gary Moore, and his answer to these questions speaks volumes about the news business in the 1920s and the prevailing mindset of white Americans then. No reporters went to Rosewood in 1923. A few telephone calls were made from the general store to the 
only reporter who was also the publisher, the typesetter, and the entire staff of the Gainesville Sun. The reporter filed a story on the newswires using a method which is now known as expanding. And years later, that reporter was interviewed, and he described the process of expanding. I think there was an awful lot of exaggeration and imagination in those stories. A good newsman back in those days could take a couple of facts and make a full column story out of it. That was the art of writing and expanding. Well, Gary Moore, in his definitive book about Rosewood, explained it this way. And this is, these are Gary's words, not mine. It wasn't exactly lying if you added only bland, neutral details in the way that a high school essayist might use desperate expansion to fill up a story. For example, his name was George Washington, and he had a nose, and it was big, and he had two eyes. In expanding the story, the Gainesville reporter succumbed to the racial prejudices of the day. Many, and some would say most, white people in the former slave states were terrified to death by the notion of an armed rebellion by African Americans. And it was consistent with this fear to assume that the residents of Rosewood were a heavily armed paramilitary force. And as the Washington Post reported, they were defiant. Their word, not mine. It was also consistent with the prejudice of the day to simply assume that the assembly of white men at the carrier home was perfectly justifiable because the feeling was that it went without saying that black people had nothing to fear. It's important to note that this is not a case of all white men simply being evil. Remember that when the citizens of Rosewood sought shelter after hearing all the gunshots at the carrier home, it was a white storekeeper who hid some and led them to safety. Also remember that some of the people sought shelter at the sawmill in Sumner, and it was a white foreman who hid them from the mob. The sheriff believed that the newspaper articles that implied that the mob was justified in going to the carrier home because they had been told that the accused rapist was to be found there. This was untrue. And the sheriff was not shy about saying so. On January 13, that's the sheriff proudly holding the shotgun that was one of the shotguns that was used in these proceedings. On January the 13th, the Gainesville Sun, the same newspaper that had one employee who did everything, reported in a big headline, we were misinformed. This headline also went out over the news wires without further explanation. Bear in mind that the reports from the Gainesville Sun were the only source of information about what had occurred, and now they were misinformed. Well, in what way were they misinformed? Could it be that all of the earlier stories were expansions and, in fact, nothing had happened? As I said before, there were no journalists at Rosewood during the massacre and no journalist went to Rosewood before Moore's trip in 1982. No journalists knew what actually happened, and nobody tried to learn what actually happened prior to Moore's trip in 1982. The survivors of Rosewood were widely dispersed. This lack of knowledge, in my view, may explain why nothing was written about Rosewood before Moore's reporting began. If we assume that 
Most modern journalists are concerned about reporting the truth, an assumption which we may challenge. The absence of reporting was understandable. Responsible journalists were silent, and historians had no reason to believe that a massacre had occurred. That is, until Gary Moore came along. The silence about Rosewood was, according to Moore, the result of what he called psychological denial. He made it his business to see to it that Rosewood would never again be forgotten. Sorry, but it's warm up here with that light shining on me. In 1983, 60 years after the massacre, Moore persuaded the editors of CBS's 60 Minutes to run a segment about the Rosewood Massacre. But the, the, the broadcast, which you can find on YouTube, did not address the question of why no one was familiar with the fact that a massacre had occurred. And it is significant to note that after the segment was broadcast, a, a Rosewood survivor claimed that the story was full of lies. A University of Florida psychologist opined years later that those black people who were at Rosewood showed the classic symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. Fear, denial, and hypervigilance about being with white people. Nevertheless, a small group of former residents' family members wouldn't let the matter go. And in 1993, 70 years after the massacre, the law firm of Holland and Knight took on a pro bono case for the survivors. Now, let me be clear. The word reparations was never mentioned in that case. But compensation was sought for the destruction of private property, which should have been protected by the state. The suit died for technical reasons, but Holland and Knight wouldn't let it go. They successfully lobbied the Florida legislature, and in 1994, arguing for equity, justice, fairness, and healing, the legislature agreed to up to $150,000 to each of nine people who could prove that they lived in Rosewood in 1923. Miss Lizzie, used her funds to create the Real Rosewood Foundation Incorporated, a nonprofit dedicated to preserving the history of the town of Rosewood. In 1997, a major motion picture entitled Rosewood was released. The film had a well-known cast, starred John Voigt, as the store owner. Ving Rhames, Don Cheadle, later won an Academy Award, and Esther Roll, who was in television sitcoms. But the film was a, a, a critical and financial failure. And while it was very, very loosely based on the events of Rosewood, it should not be seen as anything approaching the reality of the nightmare that occurred. In 2004, 2004, the state of Florida posted a historical marker at the site of the town. Today, the marker is frequently vandalized, and Confederate flags are prominently displayed in the area. Today, 101 years after the devastation, what is the lesson of Rosewood? I can only give you my opinion. Memories can be painful. Some may question why we torture ourselves with the memories of such horrific injustice. What can possibly be gained by recalling the evil of so long ago? Did you read your newspaper this morning?
Look around you. Look at the state of the world. If we don't learn from history, we are doomed to repeat it. Lord, help us. Thank you for your attention. Be delighted to take any questions. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Questions from the audience?